Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. I want to read three verses of scripture. Uh, verses 10, 11, and 12. And, and you do not have these verses in the back. So just jump there with me. Luke 16 verse 10. I want to talk to you tonight for a few moments before we pray. Thank God for how you moved Sunday. And people got healed and delivered and restored and made right with God. Hallelujah. It was wonderful. And I believe that same anointing is present here tonight to touch you. Come on. And to touch you who are watching, wherever you're watching. But tonight I felt like God gave me an, an assignment to minister on what it means to have a, an assignment mentality. I haven't preached on assignment in a, quite a while. And last week I was in North Carolina, asked to preach a great missions conference, the first one they'd, they've had. And, and I was honored to be the first speaker in this conference. I had two nights. And on the second night, the Lord surprised me and he gave me instruction to preach on living on assignment and what that means. And tonight, as I prayed about tonight, I felt like the Lord said, I want you to, to just briefly, I'm not going to, don't have time to preach all of this tonight, but I'm going to talk to you for a few moments about what it means to have an assignment mentality. An assignment mentality. Understanding that, number one, you have an assignment. In fact, in your lifetime, you will have a few assignments and you can live on assignment, whether, whether it's pleasant, whether you feel good about it, or whether it, it's a moment where you feel like you're struggling. Nevertheless, you can live on assignment and, and God will bless you when you do. In fact, some of us tonight are living frustrated lives because we haven't learned the secret of living on assignment with God. And in our reading, in our reading as we're going through Luke, we, we read chapter 16, and I want to highlight three verses. Jesus says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. Now there's something you need to understand. God's pathway to promoting you is faithfulness. Faithfulness is God's pathway to promotion. Now, some of you just nodding at that. So let me, let me say it one more time and I'll quote Bishop Tony Miller and maybe that'll make you appreciate it more. All right. God's pathway to promotion is faithfulness, not talent, not calling, not anointing, not potential. God's pathway of promotion is faithfulness. Not past experience, but faithfulness right now. God's pathway is faithfulness. So Jesus, in these three verses, hits on this. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. So there, there, there's a test right here. God tests us with the test of little. He tests our faithfulness with the test of little. Now remember, God doesn't test us ever so he can see what we will do. He knows what we will do. So God is not a professor testing you to find out what you know. He's testing you to show you something you don't yet know. And one of the tests God gives us is the test of little. How do you approach and handle little? How do you handle a little thing? Because the truth is, if you can't handle a little thing properly, you're never going to be qualified to handle a big thing. If you can, I, I had lunch today with a local pastor 
and he was telling me, we're talking about our dads. We, we have a, a different denominational backgrounds, but very similar story. His dad it was an evangelist and a pastor, and he grew up in the church, and he too became a, a pastor, and he pastors what is perhaps the largest church in this county, and a very humble man and a genuine man of God. And he was talking about something his dad taught him, and his dad told him, he said, son, if you're, if you're too big to preach in a small church. You're too small to preach in a big church. Uh Uh-oh. If you're too big for the little thing, you'll always be too little for the big thing. You think we'd get that, and some easily acknowledge it mentally, but little is a test. Jesus said, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust or unfaithful in what is least is unjust also in much. In other words, if I, the way I approach the small thing is the way in reality I will approach the big thing. So if I approach it with a heart of excellence, a heart of, of gratitude, a heart of thankfulness that I have the opportunity to do this thing for the Lord, if I approach it, no matter how small it is, with that attitude, then that's the way I'll approach something big that could come into my life. I've had the honor of preaching to thousands I had the honor of preaching to multiple thousands of people in one setting. But I've also had the honor of driving an hour and a half and preaching to two people. Uh Uh-oh. Hallelujah. I've had the honor of being in places where they blessed our ministry financially and they generously gave. God spoke to them and they gave exceeding abundantly above anything I would have expected. But, and, and what an honor and what a blessing that it was. I've also had the honor and the blessing of going to places where I ended up having to pay out of my own pocket to be there to minister to those people. And the way you handle those little moments is in reality the way you're going to handle the big moments. God has given us the test of little. Mm, I love your your, uh, exciting, enthusiastic response right now. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, look at the second one. He says, therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches. So then now he says, money is a test. Money is a test for you. If you can't be faithful to do with money what has eternal significance, then God will not entrust you with what are true riches. Now notice this, money is evidently in God's eyes not true riches. We see somebody with a lot of money, a lot of material stuff, and we say, oh, he's rich. Oh, she's rich. Maybe not. Because God says, if you're not faithful to do kingdom work with those resources of the natural earth, you will never be entrusted with what God calls true riches. How many wanna, how many wanna be trusted by God? with true riches, riches that transcend this earth. I I feel the witness of the Holy Spirit right there. Come on, how many are laying up treasure on the other side? That, that our giving is a result. Look, people get bent out of shape when preachers talk about money. You know why? Because people have a problem with money. And, and, and we always wanna say the preacher has a problem. Some preachers do have a problem with money because all preachers are people. And some people have a problem with money. But I can tell you that those that are always bent out of shape, those that are always harping on money, 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 and preachers and preachers and preachers, they've got as big a problem with money as those preachers that have a problem with money. Uh Uh-oh. Come on. Because money's a test. How How I handle my money, how I how I give my money to the Lord. If I can't give it away. I don't possess it, it possesses me. And that's a challenging statement, right? For us all. Because when I say that, I feel a little bit of, oh God, don't don't tell me to give it away. 
And I don't know if he will or not, but I want to live where I hold the hand of God tightly and I hold the things of God tightly and I hold the things of this earth loosely. Amen. Come on. So Jesus said, you got to be faithful with unrighteous mammon or money and so that you can be entrusted with true riches. And then verse 12, and if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? So the third test is the test of being faithful with another's. It's somebody else's. But will you be faithful to it? I had a brother years ago. He was driving, uh, driving me to a, a meeting to preach. And uh, man, he was driving. We were, we were running a little bit behind and he was driving furiously and he was driving rough and just taking the curves and just bouncing and just, and I finally, I said something. I said, you know, brother, you ought to, uh, you're driving a little bit rough. He said, I know it. I'd never drive my car this way. <laughs> so he wouldn't drive his that way, but he would sure drive mine that way. But if you're not faithful, with another's. Come on, are you hearing me? And so it, it applies in all aspects of our life. If I'm not faithful in another man's ministry or woman's ministry, the calling God's given them, the vision God's given them. See, some people never are able to step into the fullness of what God wants them to fulfill in their assignment because they've never learned to be truly faithful in another society. Because listen, faithfulness is not just doing what you're told. Faithfulness is doing what you're told with a good attitude. Faithfulness is not just following the, 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 uh, the protocol of the house or the place or the business, wherever you are. Faithfulness is not just doing the letter of the law. Faithfulness is the attitude with which you do what you do. Faithfulness is not just tithing. Uh-oh. Come on. Some people still stuck in a, a legalistic mindset about giving. And so you, you come on, don't get mad at me, but, but you know, they, they give, they give $100 and five cents or $100 and 89 cents. What is that? Somebody saying, I'm going to bless God. I'm giving, I'm paying God what I owe him. Uh-oh. I don't look around. I feel like some, I, I look, I, I don't count the offering, so I don't know. But hallelujah. I feel like somebody saying. But if you are, get free. Stop it. If you, if you got, if, if your tithe is $10 and 89 cents, give 11. Just get really wild. Just get really free. And just round that puppy up to 11. Amen. Say, bless God. Hallelujah. Come on. Because if, if, we, if we're just doing things legalistically, God's not just looking at the legalistic aspect to am I doing it? He's looking at the attitude and the heart with which I'm doing it. And if I'm just serving in another man's field, as a stepping stone to my own. God sees that attitude. God knows that that really isn't about being faithful and excellent and in serving the Lord where he's placed you. God knows that that's really all about ambition. And Jesus said, be faithful. Faithful, faithful means fruitful. I don't, I'm not going to turn there, but if you read in Matthew 25, Jesus defines faithfulness as fruitfulness. If, if I'm faithful, I'm not just holding on. I'm seeing increase happen where I'm at. Come on. Are you, are you with me right now? Hallelujah. So uh, the, uh, the mentality of assignment Somebody lift your hand and say, it's a faithful mentality. It's a mentality of faithfulness. Look with me at John chapter 17 and verse four. 
John 17, verse 4. This is the prayer of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus praying, listen to what he says to the Father. He says, I have glorified you on the earth. Can you read it aloud with me? I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you've given me to do. Now, if you, if you flip back to just John 15 and verse 8, Again, Jesus says, by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. So just in within a couple of chapters, Jesus tells us how to live lives that bring glory to God. He says, number one, you bear, not just bear some fruit, bear much fruit. Now, how many know what the fruit is? Galatians 5, the fruit of the spirit is. Somebody lift your hand and say, it's love, it's joy, it's peace. Come on. The fruit of the spirit is the characteristics of Christ Jesus. It's the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God is glorified when we live our lives in a way where we are bearing much fruit. Notice, notice he said you bear much fruit. Somebody lift your hand and say, I bear it. I don't, I don't produce it. Come on, hear me. I don't produce it. I simply bear it. He is the one who the Holy Spirit produces it in the life of a yielded believer. And all I do is display it. So the, the love isn't from Keith. It's from Jesus. And I just become his billboard. The joy isn't manufactured in my soul. It comes from the Holy Spirit in me. And I just display the joy of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. The patience, that's another one. The patience isn't something I have to work on. I yield. I yield to the Holy Spirit. And he produces patience in me. Come on. Glory to God. Is this all right tonight? So I glorify God by bearing fruit. But then verse 4 of chapter 17, very important. You got to grab this. Jesus says, I've glorified God by finishing my assignment. I have finished the work that you gave me to do. How many here tonight want to end your life able to say, I have finished the assignments God put in my life. Oh, I felt the witness of God. See, that'll please God. That's why when you lifted your hand to say, I want to, I want to arrive at that point before I leave this earth. That's why many of it, you sense the witness of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit rising up inside you saying yes and amen to that. I have finished the assignment. I finished the work that God gave me to do. And so then we, we need to know, well, what work do I have to do? What are the assignments of my life? And, and we'll get into that some, but, but hear me, God will always lead you into the fulfillment of his will for your life. I'm going to say that again. God will always lead us into the fulfillment of his will for our life. So if we're following Jesus, somebody lift your hand up and say, I don't have to worry about whether or not I'll fulfill the assignments. I just have to be obedient when he speaks to me. And he'll speak to you. And please hear me. When God speaks to a son or a daughter, it comes with clarity. It comes with clarity. Now you may not hear it clearly at first, but the more you lean into it, the more you lay it before the Lord, please understand, God's not in the business of trying to trick any of us. When, when God hides from us, it's like the way I used to hide from Isabella. It's like the way Jack hides from Josiah now. There's always something of Jack showing. Come on. Because the goal is not to trick your child. 
I know every now and then you get a little wild, mean hair. Hallelujah. Amen. I just got to be honest right here. because I. So every now and then, every now and then, you, you do that good hide where they don't know where you are. But, but usually, come on, that's not the goal of the game hide and seek with a toddler. The goal of the game is to let them find you. And, and so when you hide, you, you, you just sort of hide like this. Right? Please hear me. That, that's, God's not hiding from you. And if it seems he's hidden, you just keep looking. Or, or, or do what we read in the scripture. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Because your father wants what's best for you. And hear me, if you want to be in the will of God, you need to know he wants you in his perfect will more than you've ever wanted to be in his perfect will. Because he belongs to bless you. He longs to help you. He wants to, to bring you to a place of glorifying him. I, I like how this, translate, or this paraphrase says it. I have glorified you on the earth by faithfully doing everything you told me to do. Oh, I want to I wanna be able to say that. And then another paraphrase says, I glorified you on the earth by completing down to the last detail what you assigned me to do. Listen, a number of years ago, there was a book written called The Purpose Driven Life. It sold I, I can't, 32 million plus copies and and printed in 85 languages of the world. I mean, think of that, 32 million plus copies were sold of this book. It, it, has been, it was named the most influential book of the 20th century. I mean, and, and you more than you realize have been impacted, whether you've read it or not, you've yet, you have been impacted by the principles in the book. And there are many wonderful testimonies that came from people reading that book. I, I read one testimony of a man who was on the verge of, or a woman on the verge of suicide and somebody gave him a copy of that book. And before they shot themselves they picked it up and began to read it and it ignited in them hope that God had a reason for them to be living in the earth at this time and it turned their life around and I'm thankful for that and and and, and yet at the same time there is a a, a downside to the purpose driven phenomena that is had that is taken over why first let me say why did it connect so well because God's created every one of you with divine purpose but what then is the downside well the downside is it caused a generation and generations subsequently to become so obsessed with finding the purpose for my existence that seems to always be somewhere ahead and somewhere other than where I'm at. And so it created within all of us a level of frustration that God never intended you to live in. First of all, you need to understand this. You do not have an individual purpose. Uh-oh. If a, if a young man joins the army and, and comes and the drill sergeant says, why are you here, soldier? I'm here to find and fulfill my purpose. That drill sergeant is going to say, son, you don't have a purpose. The only purpose you have is the purpose that the United States Army has. And you need to know tonight that you don't have an individual purpose. If you're in the body of Christ, we all have one purpose, and that's his purpose. I said this when I was preaching about the church and missions. The church doesn't have a mission. The mission has a church. Come on, you need to understand that. God, God didn't create a mission for the church to have something to do. Jesus raised up the church because he has a mission. Hallelujah. And his mission is the reconciliation of all things to himself.
So would you lift your hand and say, I have a purpose. It's God's purpose. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on. Somebody lift your hand real high and say, he's called me to help fulfill his purpose. Hallelujah. Now listen, within the purpose, we all have individual assignments. Churches have assignments. Regions have assignments. This church has an assignment that is uh, unique from First Baptist Church just a, a few yards down the street. We have unique assignments. Ah. And within this local church, this local body, God brings people and he brings people that all have a uniqueness of your assignment. Ha. And when we learn to be living on assignment, then we'll stay in our lane. Because here's the thing. Every time any one of us is in the place, the lane, the assignment that God's given us, that's where grace is released. And grace is always attractive. And when you see somebody, anybody flowing in their grace, it's attractive. And if you're insecure, and if you're not sure of what your assignment is and where your place is, then you'll be attracted to that grace that is flowing in someone who is in their rightful assignment. And it'll cause you to think, I want to do that. I, I want to, that's what I want to do. Ah, well, but is that what God wants you to do? Benjamin Franklin said it this way, and he wasn't even a Christian, but Benjamin Franklin said, all men are born originals, but most men die copies. All of you, all of us were born original. There's, a, there's something unique about your life and your assignment. But sadly, most people, even within the church, or maybe especially in the church, most people, when it comes to the end of their life, they've wasted much of their life trying to be and do something they were never really assigned to do. And then sometimes people are trying to do today the assignment from 20 years ago. And God has said, you came to the end of that assignment and you're not listening to me because I'm calling you into another assignment, but you've allowed your identity to be attached to that assignment. Listen, our identity is not in where we're assigned. Our identity is in our relationship with God. My identity is not in my preaching. My identity is I'm a child of the most high God. He has called me son. He has laid his hand on me. I hope somebody can hear me right now. So my identity, hallelujah, can't be in what I do. My identity has got to be in who I am becoming and in who I am. See, we've done the same thing. Is this all right? We've done the same thing with holiness, with, with being holy. We made being holy about what we do and what we don't do. But being holy is about to whom we belong. Uh -oh. The word holy means to be separate, set apart. Well, it's not just being set apart from the world. Come on, let me understand that holiness is not defined by just what you're separated from. Holiness is truly defined by who you're separated unto. Hallelujah. Faithfulness in a marriage isn't just that, that you will not date other people. Right? I mean, you, how many know that's, that's, not a, that's not a really great marriage if it's just that I won't date any other woman? But I'm just, but, but we're just living barely tolerating each other. Uh oh. Come on. They're shouting down the hall for me, even though you're not. Amen. They're saying, yeah, preach it, pastor. Go ahead. Hallelujah. Let, let it roll. Let it roll, man of God. Come on, right? Faithfulness. Faithfulness is, is not just what I'm not doing, what I'm not participating in, but faithfulness is what I am doing, how I am living. Oh, hallelujah. Look with me at Acts chapter 8, would you? The 8th chapter of Acts. So, 
assignment. Everybody say assignment. We glorify God by finishing his assignment. I've told you before, but I love this story. One of my favorite stories that I've ever heard Bishop Kenneth Ulmer tell. And it's a true story of, of his. He was in university. And as he went to all of his classes at the beginning of the semester, one of the professors said to the students, now listen, I'm not going to grade you on your attendance to my class. He really perked up. I'm not going to grade you. There will be no homework during this season. I will only grade you on your final assignment. One paper that you will turn in on this date and your full grade will rest on that assignment. Man, he was so happy and excited. He took down all the details he thought and, and then he didn't go to any class. He said, I didn't show up once to that class. Not one time did I go to that class, but just a, a, about three days before that deadline, he said, I went to work on that paper and I just researched and I did everything and came in on the day it was due. I walked in the professor's office and said, hello. And he looked up at him like, who are you? But he, but he said, I laid it down and said, Here, here's my assignment. And, and so he got it back a few days later and it, it said at the very front of the page, you know how professors will do, it said, well researched, great research, well documented, good writing. And then that was all in black. And then in red marker, F, a big F failed with a big circle around it. And then underneath it, wrong assignment. We don't want to live our life on the wrong assignment. Oh, I don't want to live the next season of my life in the wrong assignment. I don't want to live my, my next days trying to repeat an assignment that's brought me to this point. I want to be faithful to hear God, to follow God, and to be faithful in the little Faithful with the things of this natural world. Faithful in another's. You see, we tend to think that we graduate from these things, Jesus said. So he that is faithful in little. So I, we, think, we think it's just seasons. I've gone through my season of little and now I'll never go back to that. No, I don't think it's seasons. I think there's times in our life that seasonally in some way, God brings us back to some of these basic things to see if we are still going to follow him wherever he leads us. Come on. I feel the, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Sometimes God will lead us. I, I think no matter how successful someone comes, I think, number one, you've heard me say this over and over, every pastor needs a pastor, every leader needs a leader. And I think sometimes God leads us into situations where, where though in a different place, we would be the one uh, that others would be helping to do such and such. But in that place, God says, I want you to humble yourself and I want you to help this man or this woman of God. Be faithful in that. Come on. Hallelujah. I was walking with a man of God a couple of years ago. In fact, he'll be with us in April next month on April the 14th. Uh, Les Bowling will be back with us. A powerful man of God who travels the world. He just came back from Kenya and he's back earlier in the year. He was in Singapore and he was a, a large church, multiple, I mean a mega church in Singapore. And he was there at, at, in, in an apostolic role uh, overseeing the transition from one generation to the next generation. But the cool thing was that he had been there 20 something years earlier overseeing the transition from the, uh, the other generation to this generation and then just seeing it carry on. And, and so when I first met him, when I first met him, and this is going to seem crazy to you, but when I first met him, uh, uh, I, I, I just felt in my heart, he's walking, we're walking a good distance from the meeting place to where we were going to have a meal afterwards. And I, he's carrying a big old heavy bag. So I just walked up beside him and said, uh, sir, didn't really know him. Uh, he didn't really know me, but I said, sir, let me carry your bag for you. He, he you know, did like me, like, you know, made him uncomfortable. I said, no, 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 I got it. I got it. I got it, son. 
But I insisted. I said, no, no, sir. Let me carry this for you. We got to go up this hill. And so I, uh, come on, I, I want you to hear me. I'm trying to illustrate something. Look, you don't ever get, you don't ever get to a place where you're too big to carry somebody else's bag. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Hallelujah. I felt like God wanted me to carry his bag. I wasn't trying to kiss up to him. I wasn't trying to do anything because he thought I was an idiot. Hallelujah. But I felt like it was a, uh, that God wanted me to carry the man of God's bag. And, and I've learned something long ago. When we Look, I learned when I was a kid. When we, there were prayer lines in service, I always get in that prayer line. Hallelujah. I mean, I get in the prayer line. I don't even care. I got in a prayer line for arthritis and I was eight years old. Hallelujah. Amen. They're praying for people to be healed of arthritis. And there I was. God. I think you say, well, that's crazy. No, I think I got some inoculation. Hallelujah. Come on. So <laughs> glory. what I'm trying to communicate is if there's a way where I can walk into more with God, hallelujah. Come on, somebody lift your hands. I'm not going to be too proud. I'm not going to be too big. I dare somebody to wave and say, I want as much as I can get. The old timers used to say, get all you can and can all you get. Hallelujah. And that's what I want. I want as much as I can get with God. So I picked up his bag and carried it. That was it. I didn't carry his bag the next day. It was just that moment. I felt like God wanted me to do it. So I humbled myself. Look, it wasn't easy for me to go up there and, and, and say that and, and insist. That wasn't easy for me. Easier for me to say, oh, forget it. Hey, he can carry his own bag. And then when he didn't want me to carry it, oh yeah, okay, I understand. But no, are you hearing me right now? We go through these the these tests we come to these moments where the Lord wants us to see, are we still walking in that place? You know what, what the prophet told Saul, when you were little in your own eyes, God raised you up. And you say, well, I, I, I'm not, I'm not haughty. Look, when we bow and I've done it too many times, when we live in insecurity, and when we bow to our insecurities, that is just another symptom of pride. It is arrogance on the other end of the spectrum because it's all about self. It's all about self. How many know the pathway up is down? You got to deny yourself. Denying yourself isn't just not becoming arrogant. It's also not living in insecurity. It's also not living in fear. It's also not caring to a degree what anybody thinks of, of you. You don't have to prove anything. You don't, you don't live for the recognition that God used you. So there's a lot of Pentecostals, Charismatics, they just live for the feeling of fulfillment they get from being the one that God works through. That's not healthy. Your security must be in the thrill that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you belong to God. You're his son, you're his daughter, hallelujah. And when that's true, then you live with a mentality of assignment saying, whatever, whatever you want me to do, Lord. So we end, we end with Philip in the city of Samaria. Verse five says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. First time the gospel had ever been preached in Samaria. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. And then verse 12 says, and when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Almost all the city baptized. Then the apostles, Peter and John come down and lay hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. This is revival. The first time the gospel's been preached outside of Jerusalem. 
and it is magnificent. The whole city is shaking with the power of God. Multitudes are born again. Multitudes are delivered from demons and healed. And I mean, this is, this is revival. This is, yeah. But guess what? The scripture says in verse 26, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So God speaks to his servant who he has used and worked through to lead a whole city to Christ. And he says to them at the height of the revival, he says to him, leave. Now, why did an angel come? Because Philip's not hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit say this. Why is he not hearing it? <laughs> because <laughs> this can't be God. This can't be God. I have this thought, I have this idea, but that can't be God. God's not going to tell me to leave this place. Not right now. Not while revival's happening. God's not going to send me on. So God has to send an angel to him to, to get his attention. But the Bible said he got up and went. To where? To a desert place. From a big, glorious meeting to a lonely desert road. And on that desert road, he encounters one man from Ethiopia. And he leads this man to Christ, baptizes him in water. And then as they come up out of the water, Philip is translated, picked up by the Holy Ghost and put in another city. How many like to experience that? You'll never, ex you won't experience that in the big meeting. You only get that on the desert road. <laughs> Come on, hear me. Hallelujah. Ah, and, and he never saw that Ethiopian again. What's the point for us? God changed Philip's assignment. It was all within God's purpose. Proclaim Jesus to the big crowds and now to the one individual on a desert road. But do you know a little bit about history? That one Ethiopian went back to his country and led practically the whole country to Christ. So the reality is that the fruit of ministry was greater with the one man on the desert road than in all the hundreds in the village, in the city of Samaria. I hope you hear me right now. But it didn't look like it. It didn't feel like it. Philip doesn't cast one demon out on that desert road. Not one blind person gets their sight. Not one lame person walks. Doesn't look like revival at all compared to what happened in Samaria. But he was on assignment. And he, because he had an assignment mentality, his fruit multiplied. How many like to live? How many, is there anybody here? Are you hearing me tonight? God wants you and I to live so free that we can obey him. That we can live on assignment. And that you know, I'm going to say this and we're going to pray, that you know that wherever you're at and whatever you're doing, somebody, I didn't mean to preach this long tonight, but uh, look at your neighbor and say, it's your fault. Hallelujah. Amen. You're a long-winded crowd. You're a long-winded crowd tonight. But look, look, God wants you to, I want you to, God wants you to, we want you to be free, not to live in frustration, free to enjoy the place God has you right now and free to step into what it is God's calling you to step into tomorrow. Trusting God. Pastor Margie made a beautiful post this evening about just about this very thing. Not knowing what God was doing me to preach about, but, but that the place of surrender, we learn to surrender our lives. And it's not a one-time deal. He calls us in moments of our life to surrender fresh. And if we do, it is the sign that we really trust him. That we really trust him. All right, Lord, you want me to leave this? and go down that desert road? 
where you lead me, I'll follow. Come on, how many lift up your hand and say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you because I'm going to live on assignment. And if right now you want me to carry somebody's bag, I'm going to carry the bag. And if you want me to, if you want me to vacuum a floor, I'm going to vacuum a floor. And if you want me to go witness to one person at Walmart, I'll go witness to one person at Walmart. And if you want me to teach a children's class, I'll teach a children's class. If you want me to, to preach a, a teach a Bible study, I'll teach a Bible study. If you want me to preach a revival, I'll preach a revival. Come on, if you want me to preach a revival where there's only going to be 10 people every night, I'll be faithful. I'll preach it as if there's 10,000 there. I'll, I'll pray, I'll study, I'll go into it just as if there's a million there. And Lord, if you want me to preach to 10,000, I won't tell you it's too big. I'll step up the same way I stepped up with 10 and say, Lord, if I, gonna, if I can help the 10, it's got to be you that helps them through me. So if you can help me with 10, you can help me with 10,000. So here we go. Because this isn't about me. Come on, somebody, lift your hand and say, it's not about me. To you be the glory. To you be the honor. And I want to fulfill heaven's purpose for my life. Come on, if that's you, will you just stand with me and lift your hand all over this room right now. Hallelujah. I believe there's some strongholds that are breaking tonight. I believe there's some freedom that's coming. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I, I, I want to prophesy over you. If the Lord will allow me to. I want to prophesy over you that not a person under the sound of my voice will stand before God having been busy with the wrong assignment. But that every single one of us will be about the right assignment for this season of our life. And every season between me and when I stand before God, God, help me to be faithful to the assignment that you've called me to. Come on, lift your hand. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Wow. There's an abo kundre sedra ba kosundra ba hai. Pre sundra bo kosundre ki sedra ba hai. Promombro sundre ki sedra ba hai. Come on, just begin to call out upon the name of the Lord. Just begin to pray right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's releasing you. That there's glory. There's glory in this season that God's leading us into. Ah, Lord, thank you. Come on, He's realigning some things. He's aligning us. He's moving us into into some things and. And, and some of us, he's stepping out of some things so that we can step into, hallelujah. Oh, but if you'll be faithful, ah, he'll, he'll do exceeding abundantly above. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, come on. Ah, take 30 seconds. Take 30 seconds. Jack, just sing over us. And, and while he sings over us, come on. Hallelujah. There's a prophetic anointing in this room right now. And shackles are breaking and strongholds are coming down. And I just declare that the, where there's been confusion, confusion is giving way to clarity. I declare that where there's been selfishness, selfishness is giving way to faithfulness. I declare in the name of Jesus, Jesus, that where there's been bondage, bondage is giving way to the beauty of living in the assignment of heaven. I declare in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, that you're going from glory to glory. And if the desert road, if God has you on a desert road right now, hallelujah, he's still taking you from glory to greater glory if you believe him and obey him. Come on, lift, the, lift your hands. Just receive. Oh, I say yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Oh, I say yes, Lord. Yeah. I say yes, Lord. You can use me, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, to Your will and Your way. I say yes. Lord, oh, I say yes, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. I say yes, Lord. You can use me, Lord. Come on, will you say yes if it means a desert road? Can you sing it and say, I, I say, say yes, yes, Lord. If it looks like desert right now, oh, I say yes, 
Lord. If it seems a little compared to what has been, I say yes, Lord. You, you can, can use, you can work me, Lord. Come on, can you sing it again and say, I say yes. If it seems too big for me, I, I say yes, yes Lord. Lord. If it seems I'm not qualified, Lord, I, I say yes, yes Lord. Lord. If I'm intimidated by the size, I, I say yes, yes Lord. Lord. You can use, you can use me, me, Lord. For I hear, I, I hear the Holy Spirit saying, see, there's some who just, who get so comfortable in the little that they can't walk into the big. But both are wrong. We say yes, whatever he's calling us to in this moment. We say, yes, sir, I am yours to command. I say yes. Oh, one more time. Something happening right now. Say yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Surrender. Surrender to Him. Oh, I say yes. I say Lord. yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord. You can use me, Lord. I know I said one more time, but we got to do it again for somebody. Sing. I say yes, Lord, to your will and to your way. I say yes, Lord, I will trust and obey. Oh, I say yes, Lord, you can use me, Lord. Father, I thank you. You promote us through faithfulness. I thank you for the faithfulness of your people here. Lord, I thank you that the Holy Spirit is putting a finger in areas of our life where we haven't been as faithful as we think we've been. Maybe we've been faithful physically, but our attitude hasn't been faithful. But Lord, we repent of that and we surrender to you. Father, we ask that any and every bit of selfish ambition in us be crucified. And we pray, Lord, that you'd bring all of us to a place where in our hearts it's not about us. Bring us to a place where we don't have to prove anything to anybody. Bring us to a place where though we rejoice greatly in the, the humbling reality that you can work and you are doing things through us. But bring us to a place, Lord, where that is not our, that's not the great joy of our life. The great joy of our life is that our names are written and that you are Lord and we belong to you. Father, I thank you for that security. I thank you that our identity will not be found in what we do, but our identity in this to whom we belong. So Lord, out of our belonging, our doing will flow and there will be a rest that we walk in and live in where we are not striving in flesh to try to find fulfillment to try to find our place to try to make ourselves fit but we're walking in the spirit of grace and we're walking in the rest of faith and so Lord you're accomplishing more through us than we ever could have imagined and we say yes come on can you just say yes we humble ourselves. We repent right now. And we pray your kingdom will come and your will will be done in our lives. And we give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, shout hallelujah if you receive it. Hallelujah, Jesus, we praise you. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I believe, don't sit down because we're finished, but I believe if God instructed me to, to teach and preach on this tonight, that he is releasing people here from glory to greater glory. That's what he did for Philip. But you got to have an assignment mentality. You're not in pursuit of your purpose. You're fulfilling his purpose. 
and you're just listening to his assignment in the moment. What do you have for me now? And I'll be, Lord, help me. I'll be faithful in now. And then he says, if you'll be faithful now, I'll keep promoting you. And the promotion is not so that we can feel better about ourselves, but it's so we can, we can be a vessel that he can work through in greater and greater measures. And when we get to heaven one day, oh, glory to God, what will go before us is how we fulfill his assignment. One day we can hear him say, what? Well done. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. That sounds like true riches to me. Doesn't it you? To hear him say, well done. Well done. Thank you. Oh, I feel his glory in this room. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to ask the ushers just to bring the offering buckets and we're going to pray and I want to ask you to bring your offering in just a moment, your tithe, hallelujah, whatever it is God's given you to give, be faithful in the unrighteous mammon. If you want to put it in the boxes in the back, you of course are welcome to do that anytime. That's why we have those back there. But there's something about, there's just something about bringing it. There's something about walking forward that I just like and and, and so we're going to pray tonight. Have you received tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. Anybody else feel an excitement about what God's up to? Can I tell you, God is up to something big. Hallelujah. He's up to something big. Praise God. And if you'll flow with him, if you'll flow with him, you'll go. You'll go places you never would have imagined you'd go. Hallelujah. So uh, let me mention this. Two things. Our, our duck hunt is coming up. Next Saturday, not this Saturday, but the 30th, 10,000 ducks are going to be on the grounds around us. Hallelujah. 10,000. Can you believe that? And the kids are going to run and grab them, and it's going to be a glorious madhouse. Hallelujah. It's going to be beautiful chaos for just a few moments while they go. And, they're, and, and so we need volunteers. We need you to invite, invite. This last 10 days or so, we need you to invite, invite on social media. Just share it, share it like crazy. Don't, don't, don't think, well, I shared that already. I know you did, but that was days ago. Share it again and again. And how many know people got to see things again? McDonald's still does TV commercials. Okay? They've been around forever. I mean, since the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was going through the drive-thru on his way to Gettysburg. But they're still doing commercials. So... You never can over, you will not be able to over communicate something. So just tell it, tell it, tell it, tell it. Invite, 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 invite. And while you're inviting to, to the duck hunt on Saturday, also invite to uh, the services on Sunday, Resurrection Day, because people will come to an Easter invitation. They'll respond to that when they won't respond any other time of the year. So invite, 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 and believe God with us. It's going to be amazing. This Sunday is Palm Sunday. It's going to be an amazing time. And praise God, we love you. Ladies, this Saturday is your heart to hearth. And if you didn't make it to the first one or second one, you can still come. You can still get in on it. So you don't have to register, right? They can just, you can just show up. They will have enough vittles for you. And I, I think it's going to be good vittles. Amen. Matter of fact, I may show up just for the food. Amen. So uh, it's going to be awesome. Anything else? Praise God. Well, I'm going to pray and then we're going to, we're going to give our offering and then you're going to be free to go and live and walk in an assignment mentality. Turn and tell somebody, God's got more for you than you can imagine. Some things prophetically he's spoken to us. He's spoken some prophetic things to you. And the, and, and the assignment he has for you right now is key to those prophecies being unlocked released and fulfilled so father we thank you thank you for your grace thank you for your anointing thank you for your favor lord i pray as we leave here tonight that we will indeed leave with an assignment mentality i thank you according to ephesians 4 23 we are being renewed in the spirit of our mind and i thank you that right now renewal is coming in the spirit of people's minds lord where's a new way of thinking 
that we're going to walk in and live in. As we give tonight, Lord, we give in faith. We give with joy. We thank you for enabling us to have that we might sow and we give it and we believe, Lord, that you're going to take it and multiply it a hundredfold. Not only in the life of ministry, but back to every seed sower. And we thank you now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Just come bring your gifts. Shake hands with each other. Love on each other. And we'll see you Sunday. God bless you.